In this talk, I will discuss the methodological framework that I'm using to study settlement pattern in the Nile Delta. If you don't mind, I'm going to read. Um, I have called this framework a cosmologically oriented GIS. <clears throat> Several cosmologies and ecologies have shaped Egypt since the beginning of the Holocene, when the climate changed and modified not only the landscape but forced humans to live differently from how they had lived for at least the last 200,000 years. The Nile Delta is one of the world's largest river deltas, covering an area of about 22,000 square kilometers, spanning from what is called the Delta Apex, the end of the Valley Conduit, around 160 kilometers to its long fan-shaped coastline of 225 kilometers in the Mediterranean Sea. Because of the accumulation of sediments in the coast, the gradient of the river was reduced and a system of meandering distributaries evolved in the delta. The pre-pharaonic or pre-dynastic society was constituted in relatively dispersed settlements that faced a process of political upheaval that confronted them. The islands along the Nile were possibly the best place to settle from a pragmatical point of view because they had access to drinking water all the year. The peer polity interaction that took place in Egypt evolved to a system of relatively independent polities sharing a very constricted area. At the beginning of the dynastic period, where the unification of Egypt took place, there is a society recently unified, led by a person known today as Pharaoh, and a powerful state that transformed the landscape with massive public works and large-scale architectural projects. At this stage, Memphis and its surroundings were for the most part of the third millennium BC, the capital of the nation state. During the second millennium BC, the nation state is consolidated. One good definer of this period is the archeological distinction between religion and state, and the recognition of the temple as a standardized uh, architectural feature of the urban landscape. Religion still played an important role at governmental level, but more intrinsically related to the elite rather than to the state affairs. The territory was divided into administrative districts, um, possibly divided by watershed sites along the Nile or by cultivable area. The floodplain was divided into administrative units called sepat, which possibly were defined by watersheds, as I uh, already told you, ranging in size from about 840 hectares in the upper part of Egypt, that's the, the valley, to 8,400 hectares in the Nile Delta. It is possible that the local polities were transformed into religious units congregated in the temple, and while returning their economic power and luxuries, their political influence and social power was impoverished. With all this in mind, it is normal that the Egyptians experienced several contacts with other cultures. For instance, in the 16th century BC, a flux of immigrants from the Levant founded the city of Avaris, introduced the horse and the chariot, in Egypt and took over half of the country for at least 100 years until the city of Thebes rebelled against them. The Theban royal house polity repelled them and the sovereignty of Egypt pre prevailed with the strong native polities that regained control of the country. Another example of acculturation took place in the 7th century BC due to political and social threats from the south. Sameticus I, so they say, asked for help to Greek mercenaries apparently stronger and equipped with better weaponry and strategies. During the 7th century BC, these mercenaries were allowed to control a purely Greek settlement in the Nile Delta called Naucratis. Later on, in the 6th century BC, Croesus, the last king of Lydia, would have made an alliance with Amosis II and the last king of Babylon, Nabonidus, to defeat the Medians. This alliance destabilized the whole region and created the conditions for the Persians to conquer Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt itself. With the Greeks, more explicitly after Alexander the Great, new names and new ways of doing politics were developed in Egypt. The Ptolemies, the new rulers of Egypt, managed to fusion Greek religion with Egyptian one. During the Ptolemaic uh, period, the capital of Egypt was moved to Alexandria. In this sense, even though Egypt was still functioning as a relatively independent nation state, de facto became a series of Greek colonies governed by a Ptolemaic pharaoh divided by administrative units called noms, a reminiscence of the Egyptian sepat. Alexandria diminished the political power of several settlements in the Nile Delta, including Naucratis. 
With Rome, Egypt was converted into a province of the empire, a collection of gnomes integrated within a geographical area called Egyptus. These gnomes had a capital settlement, but the settlement stopped functioning as a city-state as such. The local governor was more like an administrative officer of the Roman Empire, in charge of ensuring the flow of goods from the gnome to Alexandria, and from there to Rome. The Romans built forts on the remaining leves, as usual, um, and turtle bags of the river, or on, the, or on top of another settlement. A fully deployed army was constantly present to protect trading posts to control the flow of goods. Local enterprises reached a new level of development, and inside the settlements, it is perfectly uh, noticeable that the production of some goods was industrialized. The most evident change in the cosmology, ecology, and ideology in Egypt during the Roman Empire is the implementation of a monotheist religion, which at its highest peak of development overran the polytheistic ones, including native Egyptian, Greek, and Roman. It also marks the end of the religious tolerance in Egypt, officially in all the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, to the point of forbidding the native Egyptian writing system in AD 391 because of the Edict of, the, of Thessalonica. The first Christian temples in Egypt probably were built in Alexandria, a traditionally religious tolerant city. The church records suggest that by AD 42, Mark the Evangelist founded the Patriarchate of Alexandria. With the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, it is possible that some Christians and Jews flew to Egypt, finding in Alexandria a religious tolerant refugee where they could preach their beliefs. From Alexandria, both religions started to spread to the Delta, surviving for at least 300 years in a highly urbanized rural landscape, amongst the indifferent or otherwise hostile Roman Empire. The power of the Christian polities and the relationship with the empire was shown at the Council of Nicaea in AD 325. At this point, it was evident that the centralization of the power from Rome to the East provinces, giving political presence to cities such as Antioch, Jerusalem, and Constantinople. In AD 381, the first Council of Constantinople placed Constantinople above the cities of Antioch and Alexandria, which lost its power for its, for its stop being an honorary member of the patriarchate. It is possible that the loss of power of Egypt, ideologically and politically, played an important role in the establishment of the Rashidun Caliphate approximately in AD 640. Now, this is a, a brief introduction to this uh, uh, research, because to understand more than 4,000 years of uh, civilizations, um, it's, it's not an easy task. So. There is a very intricate historical palimpsest that uh, we need to solve. Settlement pattern in the Nile Delta cannot be understood solely by environmental factors such as fluctuations in the Nile branches. Political shifts with a high ideological charge played an important role too. With urbanism, we can track changes by analyzing architectural features, infrastructure, styles, language, settlement pattern, or even emplacement through time of some settlements their importance and the direction of the flow of goods. The most problematic part of the research has been to reconstruct the ancient river channels in the delta. A 12-meter tandem X digital elevation model dataset has been used to identify the Funk River branches along with geoarchaeological reconstructions of ancient settlements. Furthermore, ancient maps have been georeferenced to compare different ways of representation of space and to analyze to what extent the river has fluctuated in the last centuries. Vertical georeferencing, as I call it, is also helpful to align modern photos of the Nile to ancient ones just before the construction of the High Aswan Dam during the annual flood. The purpose is to visually analyze how the annual flood looked like and have a better understanding of the social endeavor in ancient times. Nonetheless, it is difficult to link each branch to a site in a specific period. A spider diagram was created in order to see if there is an organic relationship between the sites and the branches. As expected, we can barely see that the constellation of the first five nearest neighbors of each site form a shape similar to the hydrological network. Nonetheless, this do not solve the problem related to temporality. Although, an idea came up after a while. 
Years ago, while working on the project Trayectoria Temporal y Espacial de las Investigaciones del CIESAS in Mexico City, we developed a relational database in Microsoft Access to visualize the spatial extent of the research in this academic center. The problem was that each project reported spatial information differently and mostly qualitatively. As a starting point, we implemented into the database the unique identification numbers of the National Geostatistical Framework designed by the National Institute of Statistics, Geography, and Informatics in Mexico, uh, which referenced the statistical information from censuses and surveys with their corresponding geographical locations. We linked each academic project to a state, municipality, or locality, and the only thing we needed to do is to read the synthesis of each project to extract the information. A query was created to list the project information and the geographical information, which is basically a collection of unique IDs. Finally, these IDs were joined in RGIS to the actual shape files of the National Geostatistical Net Framework. What if we consider each archaeological site in Egypt as a project, and instead of a National Geostatistical Framework, we treated temporality as a set of qualitative uh, variables? linking each site to an end quantity of temporalities, depending on what has been reported on the field. In Egypt, the Delta Survey has mapped more than 700 sites, but just as the project in CSS, in relation to space information, each archaeological site in Egypt contains relative dating added differently, depending on the quality of the data. In some cases, they rely on coins or inscriptions, and in even fewer cases, they can use absolute dating, Eventually, only with excavation or inscriptions, they could have a more accurate dating, but only a small percentage of the site surveyed has been excavated. With this database, it is possible to work with the available data, regardless its precision, and new data can be added to the same site whenever it's needed or whenever new information is obtained. Here, the spatial information is linked to each surveyed site, and the temporality of each site can be mapped using any GIS software and potentially analyzed with packages for temporal analysis. For now, the most tedious task in this project is to fill the database, but I am certain that the next year you will be able to see the results. The objective is to map all the sites temporally and using a spatial analysis to create a multidimensional model of the river channels and analyze the rise and fall of each site depending on the political and cosmological shifts. This framework tries to represent the social mobility and urban transformations in the Nile Delta, while it explores the political development of the inhabitants of this region. The final goal is to dis dissect the Nile Delta historical palimpsest. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>